and my passion and love has always been in the wool weaving. But when we start to look at the extent to which weaving was done in all of our communities, every one of them, it's just breathtaking. And I'm really excited to be able to make the link to, to Keiko and then spin that link to our friends who are here. There's some of our weavers here and some on this side who we have spent the last year or two with getting to know and sharing our vision together. And today, it's an important and beautiful day because Keiko has brought us together uh, in the way in which she works <coughs> as someone who knows how to connect and bring communities together. And when she first asked me to be a part of it, I kind of was a little reluctant because I didn't know if I wanted to share anything. But in my journey of healing and of understanding the foundation of our people through this work, I began to realize that even though weaving is Salish weaving, musky weaving, stalo weaving, deep within the fibers of it, since way back to the beginning when we found our first slate spindle world, how long were people weaving here? 500 years ago? 300 years ago? And so you start to understand that all the time you were growing up and you were in all of other cultures, you can now be in awe of your own. You can now look at the history of the Salish people and say, wow, wow, weaving our way. Weaving our way. And to me, that's the passion <coughs> and the love that our people share. Even today, and we're on a, we're on a way back to, to doing that in all of our communities. We're, there's a big resurgence now coming after 30 years of working my sisters and I and other people in my community, we're seeing it in all communities. We now have a face page and it's filling and people are excited and we're meeting people all over who are feeling the same way and saying, this can't be all there is. So I always like to say, well, for every step I take forward, I take 100 back. And I bring forward with me that understanding and those values that make us responsible for our environment. That when we destroy our environment, we're destroying ourselves. Because we need the food, we need the fibers, we need the fiber of life that sustains us all of these thousands of years. And it's woven into this beautiful work that each and every one of the weavers has found their way through. And so when I came to share, I said, well, I'm not sure how I want to do this. I don't want to teach everybody Salish weaving, but I realized that if we're all weavers, we all do the same technique, which is tabby, twill, and twine. It's done all over the world. So we can share that. We can take our loom, in which I'll show you in a little while with demonstration. We can warp that loom up, and we can create beautiful things on there in the structure of it, but then we can maybe we can find our own way by, I asked the ladies to go home and look and research their history, look for their patterns, and then come forward and I'll teach them how to weave their own. And that way, they are connected to their history, not just mine. And so the women did that and we came up with some beautiful designs that are very unique and different because everybody found their own way. Sometimes we use different materials and sometimes somebody would ask me for help and I would say, I can't help you. Because you found your own way and it's not the same thing I would do. And so I'm not there to mark you or grade you, I'm there to just share with you the same way I'm sharing today. And it's taken 30 years for it to sort of make its way also into um, a place that I never thought would happen, and that's my year of college, so I'm teaching there for the next two semesters. I'm also sharing up at Brock House. And we have our friend on the North Shore, uh, Janice George, 
who also is sharing on that side of Vancouver. And so there's a real awakening um, in not only our community, but the whole community of Vancouver, that Vancouver and the Lower Mainland and even going east to Chilliwack and all the places, that there is a beautiful foundation here, Canada, that you are a part of. We're not just 150 years old. We're as old as time. And when we go to any country in this world, we always want to look at the art and see the history through it. And so now we get a chance to say, wow, again, leaving our way. Look what these people were doing here pre-contact. Wow, they had intelligence. They could add, divide, and subtract and make beautiful patterns. The women were so amazingly intelligent. What integrity they had. They, they went out into the environment and they found dyes that were also medicines. So if you got a sting in it or you drank it to clean your blood, you didn't have to take penicillin. <laughs> or you could make a dye a beautiful green color. Or you can make the rest of it and dye it and make the fiber that actually gathers the mountain goat and dog hair and and the down that we use to make our beautiful warm blankets. What a beautiful plant. Wow, and then I heard this beautiful saying that said, for every ailment, God has a plant to cure you. Creator, are we paying attention to that? No, we run off to the doctor and doctor gives us a pill, but the doctor never tells you how you got that way. They don't say, well, you know, maybe if you didn't drink so much, you wouldn't have diabetes. And you know, in our communities, we never had those ailments. We didn't have diabetes, we didn't have people live to be old and under. All of our elders did. Now, we're lucky if our elders make my age. <laughs> and a little older. Because people are checking out early because of their lifestyle. Why is their lifestyle like that? Maybe there's a deep sadness in some people who went to residential school. Luckily, my mom wouldn't let us go. And so we have a lot of things on our plate that have to be dealt with. And maybe I didn't get as many dealt with as some people did, but the ones that I did get, I found the healing through this work I did. And I don't know if it's work, I think it's a reflection of our, our healing in our, in our life. And it gives you a sense of, of hope and of life and of quietness and of teachings. It teaches you every day. I've been leaving for 30 years and I'm still learning. Last year, we had the opportunity to bring home for the first time blankets that had been sleeping in museums in Europe. One was 200 years old, one was 150 years old. Most of them are all 150 years old. And when they came home, and we were with them for the first one that was open from Finland, I almost felt like those wonderful shows I used to watch on TV when they first went into the pyramids, which they shouldn't have done, opened them up, and opened up King Tut while he was sleeping for those 2,000 years. Why do they think they made a pyramid? So we would leave them alone. <laughs> but no, something in us has got to go in there, break it down, and drag them out. And it's history. Um, they call it archaeology. I, I don't. However, in one way, there's always the catch-22. Um, if those blankets didn't travel to Europe and be in the museum, would they still be here? Highly probably not, because they're fibers and they break down. And the baskets that they found were so deep in the mud, that's why they were able to um, save them. Um, and in the U.S. down in um, Mia Bay, uh, on the west coast, they did find a blanket where a mudslide had happened and the whole longhouse had collapsed on top of the whole inside. So they could find, they found everything that the life of a person then, and the people must have known something was going to happen or they were out fishing, they were doing something because it was abandoned, but it had been abandoned, like left as if they were living that moment, and they, they got out. So they found a blanket in there, which was between three and 500 years old, way deep in the mud, 
And so we know this is the work we are women were doing because people today, bless their hearts, need to be educated to say they thought we just started weaving lately, a hundred years ago. No, maybe that dye came from this, this or this or this because they don't want to give credit to the intelligence of the people who lived here. That maybe the Europeans taught them, or maybe that dye came, no, 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 it was here. And so there's so much to learn and so much to educate ourselves with us. And I think that's the beauty of this, this team that we've had leading our way. We've taught each other things. We've gotten together like they did in the past. And we all have a culture that we are proud of and that we do come from and that the threads come through that to us and it wakes us up to better understand each other. And so that's what weaving our way has done. It's, we're still going to be weaving our way right through from this world out into the next one. And we'll come back and we'll bring with us again the threads that define maybe who we are. And I love the beautiful saying by Maya Angelou that I've repeated many times in the class that I share, and hope other people will share, other, that as much as we are alike, we are different. I want to stay different. I don't want to be the same as all of you, but I want to share my similarities with you. If we were all the same, it would be kind of boring in this world. And so we have to celebrate our differences and embrace them rather than turn them away and think they're wrong. And that's what sharing is and caring about each other as people, as human beings. And so in the master plan, we don't know what it has on the masterpiece, on the master weaving, but we're all threads of that weaving. I'm looking forward to the, seeing the next little part that we're going to show you, a couple of videos that we've worked on. One with Paula, which I'm, I'm really grateful that Paula persisted to come through with me because lots of times I just go, oh, I don't know, maybe not, but I'm, I'm certainly glad she did. And Keiko's done a different one um, with her own camera people. And so um, we'll have a look at those both and um, we can have a little bit of a break later. And I'm gonna just give you a bit of a de demonstration on one of my looms, show you how it all works. Um, our looms um, are very old as well. And I had the opportunity of working on one that was 150 years old at the museum. It was uh, held by a family in Victoria. And then these little are just looms we've created for this whole reason of demonstration, but mostly at home I have a seven foot loom by six feet high, and I'm working on always on bigger pieces, which I am right now. In fact, I'm doing two reconciliation pieces right now for Christ Church Cathedral, for the Anglican Church there for reconciliation. And um, then uh, in between that one, because I have some time to do it, they'll both be six feet long. But I was approached by a healing center that's in Quiquitla. Um, and so they're looking for something. And I'm really grateful and I'm honored and I'm humbled to always be called to do uh, meetings that are valuable to the community. Um, and also in the patterns being valuable, um, I also thought it's time to move the patterns out of their elements. So I spent the summer with mural painters and we had fun under the Granville Bridge uh, painting the pillars under the Granville Bridge. There's two of them. And those, my sister texted me last night and she said, hey, I've seen your pillars on CTV. And, I, and she said, they're so beautiful, Deb. I wish Musquin could appreciate what you're doing. And I said, Gail, if you're appreciating what I'm doing, then I'm happy because they aren't my pillars. They're yours and they're yours, and they're ours. They're for all our people. They are a reminder and a beautiful significance of who we are, not who Deborah Sparrow is. I'm merely the voice. I'm merely the responsible one for bringing it back to where it should have always been. And so it's not my work, it's our work. That's what I share with these lovely ladies that I work with. It's theirs, it's ours. It's a reminder of the deep roots that all of us have, no matter where we come from, that you now can bring your friends to the pillar and say, look at our history here. 
you can go over to 12th and Kingsway where I did my second one and it represents the sea and the forest and the ocean and then the skyline and it stops you when you're having road rage on 12th Avenue <laughs> at a stoplight and you look up and you go wow ooh, we've been our way <laughs> boy we really got it now okay yeah. <laughs> and then the last one I did which I am so moved um, my grandfather's mother uh, lived in Stanley Park and she was her and her husband were the last to actually be asked to leave Stanley Park uh, before it was a park a knock came on their door and when she answered the door and this is my grandfather's words verbatim and she said she opened the door and the RCMP was standing there in his red coat and <coughs> said you have 45 minutes to gather your belongings and get out and he had a gun with him so they raced around their place and took whatever was important and walked out and by the time they got from here to the road, the house was burned down. And so she left there and her husband said, what are we going to do now? And they parted ways and she came home to Musqueam and he went back to the North Shore to Capilano. And she died at home, which I'm sure she was happy for. but. All these years that my grandfather would take me there and we'd sit in the bench and he'd say, this is where Mama lived, there's where I played. He was actually raised by his grandmother because in those days a lot of people couldn't have children or if they did, they died young because of diseases, new diseases. And uh, he was raised by his grandmother, his grandparents in Musqueam. And so he would come there to visit her and he said, this is where she lived and this is where I would visit. So this year, uh, we our last mural was uh, to go into Stanley Park during the Skookum Festival. Mm -hmm. So um, I was downstairs doing my laundry and, and I looked at a dresser where my pictures were and her picture was standing there. And I thought I better take my great grandmother back upstairs and hang her back on the wall where she was because I've been painting. And I put her down on top of this weaving and then I thought, wow, what a beautiful, beautiful thing to see her picture lying on her history and it stayed in my mind and then when the mural guys came over and we had to discuss what we're going to put in Stanley Park I said I think I have an idea well maybe it's not an idea maybe it's her saying do this and so I showed them and they said fabulous and then I thought to myself okay Stanley Park controversy it's political the province owns it or the feds own it and if I put my gra grandmother up there are they gonna come back and say something to me and if they do I'm ready for them so I, we went to work and we, we built this plywood and we painted her up there with our weaving sign designs behind her and when they were done I was like so taken back again because it looked like she was so happy to be home and that she could walk out of the mural and my Facebook went crazy and all my relatives were going oh, thank you thank you thank you if they're not a weaver and they feel it really belongs to me this was a time where they could look at that picture in the weaving and say it belongs to all of us and they all felt a part of that and they were honored and she looks so magnificently beautiful that she's happy wherever she is that we are continuing on now the journey that they had started so that's how we're weaving our way and i'm happy and i'm honored always to work with all the beautiful ladies and all the men who support that because men and women always work together we had a relationship that was balanced Today they call itself uh, women's lib. Well, we had women's lib way back. Because we had to work together. We didn't look at individually each and say, oh, well, she's this or he's that. Or it was a, we had to or we wouldn't survive. We were on this path to assimilation. And Keiko talked about reconciliation and what is it? And then we say, welcome to the unceded territories of the Musqueam people, but is that just like a word or a sentence? Because 
what does it really mean to anybody in Vancouver or Canada? It's almost like patting us on the head and saying, you know, I know we're on your unceded territories, but so what? Because we're not doing anything in dialogue about it. Maybe our first step, and people say, is reconciliation, and uh, how do we reconcile? I don't know if there's an answer, and there shouldn't be one immediately, and certainly not over a year. And so let's pour a lot of money into it and make all the Indians happy. Let's start making that step towards it. Is money the answer? Well, <coughs> I don't know. I'm only questioning, too. I don't know what the answers are, but I think each one of us has a way in which we feel we can weave the answers onto the masterpiece. Maybe we can each have a strand. And when we each take a strand, we are responsible for it, and we feel somewhat connected to the spinning that's going to take us in a direction together. And what a beautiful metaphor. Like, I even like weaving our way because it comes out to be, wow. <laughs> wow, are we amazing in this group that we've been working with. So when weaving was gone, we didn't go up seeing it. I didn't know about it. And I was so fortunate to have my grandfather live. He lived to be 100, the same grandfather I fished with. And I used to spend every day with him driving along the shores of Vancouver and Richmond and New West and Surrey. And sometimes we made it to Chilliwack. And sometimes we made it to Mission because his wife came to, from Chilliwack. And so we could, um, we could tell stories that links us all up. And we can talk about what was residential school to him. Kokolitsa, where he went and where he met his wife. And what was her story. And so he would share all of these with me. And what an amazing opportunity to be with him for the last 15 years of his life, almost every day driving with him and him sharing what it is, the values that grow from the original way in which we, as first people, saw our lives as valuable. And this beautiful work that we stand on it, that it is our roots and it is our history that was pulled up from underneath us. And the 150 years of unspinning and unraveling of the whole communities, of the way in which assimilation happened, and how depressing it is, and how awful it is, and hurtful it is. And I must have indirectly felt that hurt from my grandfather and grandmother and my father who went. And so that genetic trickle down of, they know scientifically now, and every gene travels through you, whatever your family's history is, but I heard a beautiful thing that said if, if there are the birds in the genetics, there's also the survival skill. There's also the happiness that comes later when you get to go on that journey and understand why you exist. And I'm grateful for, for that history that has given me the ability to find my strengths through its beauty and integrity that you see on the front of this table. That Deeply woven within the history is all the values that we as First Nations always exercised in our villages. And when the first ship arrived here in 1791, I leaned outside my village. And seven canoes came from the bluff and went out to meet the Spanish ship. And the captain said, seven canoes are coming to greet us in what we know to be, and they use the English term, point great. And in the canoes are many people, and they are wearing beautiful blankets. The man stands on the bow of the boat, and he's wearing a beautiful blanket. But he's also holding a salmon. And so this tells you where salmon is so important to us. And he passes it to me. And I pass him back something, and he says, no. I didn't want anything from you. He just wanted to share and honor what he has at his table. And as they looked inside the canoe, they saw evidence of all fishing gear. They saw nets made out of cedar. They saw harpoons. They saw everything a person would need to have a life of fishing. And yet today, as First Nations, we have to go to Supreme Court to prove that we're allowed to fish. Mm -hmm. 
And so there's this huge uh, fight that we're always in to identify ourselves, to say that we come from here. And even the wet site that I spoke of earlier, that goes by 3,700 years ago, they say, prove you come from here. Pierre Elliott Trudeau, when he was in office, in a conversation on national TV with James Gosnell, said, who said this land belonged to you? I do not see it written anywhere. There is no sign on a mountain top. And all of a sudden I'm sitting there on TV and I'm not even doing any of the work that I've been doing, but I certainly was my grandfather and father's daughter. And I said, it isn't written on a mountain top. It's written in the earth. Wherever you open the earth, the evidence of who we are, and how long we've been here is there. You call it archaeology, we call it our personal belongings. We call it our history and our values. We may not write the same way as you, but that doesn't make us inhuman. It doesn't make us that we didn't live here. We can go to any country in the world and we can find out that all most people started on oral tradition. And that oral tradition is as valuable, if not more, than anything because it can my grandfather would laugh. He goes, what do you guys use those computers for? He said, I can unplug it. <laughs> but I can't unplug this. So generation after generation after generation is responsible for how I stand today on my leaving and give my name. How I stand here when I get married or I, my loved one leaves this world. And every one of you is a witness to that, but I might call only two of you to make sure that you remember what happened today. And if it's a huge gathering, I'm going to call four. And I'm going to ask you that if I make a mistake in my court 20 years from now, you will come forward as a witness to share with us what I might have forgotten. But as a man who lived to be 100, that man never forgot anything. He went to Supreme Court. He helped us to win the Shaughnessy case where the golf course is today because he sat in the back room with his elders when they were making the negotiations. He sat back there and he listened. And when he stood up to say, uh, excuse me, I want to say something, the elders said, sit back down, you're too young to notice. But he kept it all in here. He kept the words. And when they went to Supreme Court and they did everything to out-trick him, they couldn't. And when the opposition said something to him. He said, why are you asking me the same question in three different ways? Do you think I'm stupid? And the Supreme Court judge giggled and said, I guess he told you. Because that's who we are. It's in our DNA to remember our relatives, my relatives over here who have come, my grandmother's relatives, and acknowledge them and to know that if I go to Vancouver Island or I go down to the American side which wasn't there before I know my relatives I know who I am grandpa said before he passed know who you are and know where you come from because if you don't know that that's when you feel nothing and he added by saying maybe a lot of people feel nothing because they're roaming around looking for themselves when all we have to do is be connected to who we are. And so I know that that's what weaving started to do for me. When I was a lost girl in a dark room like this in the mid part of my life, and I called out to say, who am I? What answered me was a creator and all the people who wanted me to come forward with a kind of vision that's going to help put us on a journey of reconciliation, but I didn't know that three or 30 years ago. I just did it one step at a time. And I followed my instincts, I followed my inspiration, I followed my spirit. Because that's what inspiration means, it's in spirit. When you're there and you're connecting, it gives you that sense that you need to feel like you're whole again. So I was paying attention not only to what I was instinctively feeling about what my grandfather was saying, what my friends were saying, some of them going to my longhouse and listening to the elders, which I grew up listening to. When I sat in a longhouse, when I was a child, we weren't allowed to talk. We had to sit quiet, and that was part of what we needed. To be quiet, to listen, to learn, 
And so we did that. And today, if we go in today, we see a lot of kids running around, which is not good. You know, and, and we know that with our households. We're allowing our children to, you know, talk back, to be freer than, than we ever were. If I talked back to my parents in those days, back in the day, I would have been punished for a week. Today, it's like, don't talk to me like that and go play. And it goes over their head, and they talk like that to everybody. And yet, we have to rein them back the same way we rein back ourselves when we're looking for answers to what is going on and the changes in our world. We're changing so fast, we're moving so fast, and I always say, where are we going? When people are on that road to you're going somewhere, I stepped off and I said, I don't want to go with you. I don't know where you people are going, I don't want to go. And I wanted to find out what were the visions of my people before they were assimilated. And I heard about this work and we started I started to study jewelry making and the elements of the Salish people and I was taken back with honor to know that I was actually part of that and could be a part of it because I didn't know about it either. And when you better understand who you are and what your place is, you better understand other people. And it's about educating each other about who we are as human beings. <laughs>